number two, which is the citizens to be heard. Um, just for introduction's sake, I'm Christopher Herring, the chair of the uh, Small Business Advocacy Committee. Um, Anita is our vice chair. Uh, actually, just for all the uh, citizens who are representing, uh, please tell, tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Randy Elgin. I'm representing District 6. Rene Dominguez, I'm director of the Economic Development Department. Ray Rodriguez, deputy city attorney. Chichinaka, office manager. Michael Sinden, director of economic development. Kelsey Young, we did the contracts team for um, transportation council purposes. Irene Chavez, the representative for District 7. Uh, Steve Gonzalez, representative of District 9. Sue District 1. Mike Hall, District 2. And Juan Pizzacola, District 4. I'd ask also if you could please uh, put your phones on vibrate um, so as not to disturb anyone who may be speaking. Okay. The first person uh, that is on the list to be heard, you have three minutes. Um, who's going to be my timekeeper? I can do it. You got it? Okay, so um, it'll be Rick Carter. Yes. Hey, good afternoon, uh, and, and thank you for having me. Thank you, uh, Mr. Herring, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Rick Carter. I'm here uh, representing the Fair Contracting Coalition. Uh, I'm a mediator. I, I uh, previously had worked at USAA serving under General McDermott as the uh, uh, Financial Strength Committee and uh, our chairman. And so uh, I'm here with some concern with regard to uh, a letter that was uh, dated November the uh, 14th uh, indicating a change of direction with regard to our small minority and women-owned architectural and engineering firms. Uh, that they would no longer be included in the diversity contracting standards, as I understand. Uh, so I, I want to make a request to uh, consider reversing that directive. I, I feel like it's fair to, you know, to keep all of our small businesses, uh, especially the minority women uh, businesses, uh, on a fair playing field with the larger companies. Financing is available for these companies. The financing is generally based upon what contracts are awarded to those companies. Uh, this is an economic accelerator that is very positive for the city of San Antonio. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, uh, Mr. Cabinets and his staff. They do a great job. They uh, engage the Fair Contracting Coalition on a very favorable basis, and I'd like for that to continue. So I appreciate the opportunity to voice my opinion on behalf of small minority women business owners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. The next person is so uh, Sophia. Torres from the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Hi, good afternoon. Distinguished members of the Small Business Advocacy Committee, my name is Sophie Torres and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Today I stand before you on behalf of our Board of Directors regarding the changes to the Beta program for architecture and engineering solicitation. Back in 1989, the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber helped create the Cebeda program as a way to help more small minority women-owned businesses get awarded big contracts from the city of San Antonio. Our environment has been integral. We know and understand the need to nurture and cultivate these small minority women-owned businesses to be successful within our city and for our future success. Cebeda was designed to provide flexibility and to be able to readjust metrics as you utilization increases. We also understand that the proven success of Cebeda is evident with architecture and engineering firms applying to these contracts. We are excited to see the success and optimistic it will be the new standard for other industries as well due to the program's demonstrated positive results. However, we are concerned that by removing these points, small local businesses may suffer. We urge the City of San Antonio to continue issuing disparity studies in the future to monitor the architecture and engineering category and what effects these changes will have on the percentages of awarded contracts to small minority and women-owned businesses as well to local businesses. We hope the changes to the Cebeda program for architecture and engineering firms are evaluated on a quarterly basis by the Goal Setting Committee to properly assess the changes in policy and the removal of prime evaluation preference points as well. The assessment should be made public for transparency purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Serena Shakur, S.J. and J. Solutions. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Serena Shakur. I am a business owner. I 
do window cleaning, power washing with my son, in residential, commercial, and we make it shine the first time. I'm also a member of the FCC. But um, I first want to really thank this, this committee. I truly do. Because you get to oversee things. You get to really help us address some issues that might go unresolved. So I just really sincerely thank you all. I'm a recipient of your help. And just want to say real quick, those preference points help me. I'm a prime now. So you just cannot take that stuff away. And it needs work. It truly needs work. I'm a prime with this uh, airport. So this program is truly important. So I, along with so many others, have some real concern. And I really want to address the city spending money with EDF. So my question and my concerns are about the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. So you don't say this, I don't say this, but EDF says we exist to drive San Antonio's economic growth and diversity through recruiting new business. To San Antonio, <coughs> helping our local companies stay and grow and bridging the gap between education and industry to build a sustainable workforce pipeline for the community. That's what EDF says. EDF also says the chambers serve as the voice of the business community, striving to improve the quality of life in the city with business advocates role, while EDF is a marketing and sales organization <coughs> actively promoting um, our city to national <coughs> and international business, working to bring new job, producing investment to San Antonio. So if that's their mission, if that's their mission, and if SBAC presented to the city manager, who is a board member, along with other public tax paying entity, presented to them on our behalf a solution that they could adopt with regards to black and Asian chamber representation? Have they chosen not to adopt any of those suggestions? That's what I want you to think as this committee, because this is important. It's a huge concern to me, and not just me, it's a concern to many people in the community, in the black community, in the Asian community. They're saying they don't want black and Asian chamber uh, representation. Okay. We're, not, uh, we're not allowed. So, okay. So I just want to say, why is the city investing taxpayer dollars in an organization that excludes black Americans and Asian American chamber representation? Fine, thank and lastly, and lastly, because y'all relate to, <laughs> y'all relate to, <laughs> you know, is the mayor concerned with this problem? Because what he says, he's developed a core commitment to civic uh, participation and universal values of liberty, thank, justice, thank, thank you, equal Mr. opportunity. Thank you, Mr. And it doesn't exist. Thank you, Mr. It's not equal opportunity. EDF is receiving our taxpaying dollars, using our taxpaying dollars to help and build with the other next, chambers and their the businesses. The and we have no chamber representation who would knowledge. use EDF resources to help us bring business and help to our PG. Thank you. Thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my name is Grace Rose Gonzalez, and I am uh, the principal and owner of Grace uh, PG Design Group. Um, I'm a past uh, D7 SBAC representative, and I was on the board for all the work on the disparity study local preference points on the five year diversity initiation. At that time, I was on the board of uh, San Antonio's Bank Chamber as well, and was on the Small Business Committee and was a liaison from SBAC to San Antonio's Bank Chamber. Currently, I'm on swimming for the Precinct 4, and we're launching our disparity study this 2019. The repeal of the local preference points for A&E came to my attention from a letter that was addressed to the engineers via email before Thanksgiving. It was dated November 14th and it was signed by Renee Dominguez and it notified the local preference points would no longer be used in goal setting for upcoming RFQs and RFPs. I contacted the chair, Chris Herring, who was unaware of the letter, and also Tori Stanley, the executive director of AIA, who was totally unaware of the repeal, 
and had not received a letter or briefing from EDD staff. She told me that EDD staff had contacted her on the 8th and 12th saying they needed to meet after hours to give her some information and that they were very vague. Because of the requirement of after hours, she, she could not accommodate. She took the letter I sent her to her leadership and they have said they need to have a board meeting in January to discuss this and it had serious concerns. Which brings me to all the outreach that was done, all the meetings that we had were undone by a letter that only a select few knew of and participated in briefings, which were only the engineers. Regardless of the numbers and the charts and the pies that you're gonna show me, it is after the fact and an insult to all the people and businesses that gave time and resources to. The ordinance, as I understand, gives EDD staff the ability to modify without a formal council vote, which I believe should be a requirement for transparency. Because of this ability to modify, EDD has shown a complete <coughs> lack of respect to the SBAC and to the design community. I believe the ordinance needs amending to ensure processes are in place in the future. I recommend that there be a task force of industry members that own design and engineering firms with SBAC much like the five-year diversity to monitor and ensure the communication utilization are in place and functioning. Also, I would like to see the local preference points reinstated until findings from this task force is made public. There is chatter in the community that the state, that the state level engineering consortiums are looking to undo the entire hub and certifications that are at the state. There's also chatter that the engineers are threatening to the city over the utilization of small and mid-sized design and engineering firms, and the city is afraid of this. So they gave in on the local preference points. We as S at Swimby firms do not have lobbyists that represent us at the state and local levels. We are busy responding to RFQs that will give us work in the future. So a task force is needed so we can ensure that our voices are being heard and our business is given opportunities that we work hard to acquire. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jane Gonzalez Mendoz. I'm going to pass this along to the SBAC members. Hello, everybody. My name is Jane Gonzalez, and I'm the owner of MedWheels Incorporated, a medical equipment company that is located in the east of San Antonio. And I have to tell you that all the work that we did for the 2015 disparity study <coughs> that triggered. Um, Sebeda ordinance that required the local preference points. And I want to commend the city because with the efforts of SBAC, with the efforts of all of us working together jointly, with that provided an opportunity for companies to graduate from being subcontractors to prime. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. We want to create jobs in the neighborhoods with our minority local companies that are already existing in our neighborhoods. I'm going to present to you a situation through my business of some of the challenges that still remain with us and why it is very imperative that we continue working together, identifying problems, and trying to see what we need to do to fix them together, right? It's, to, it's togetherness. We work with the city. we got to all work yeah. together. It's not about you know, throwing rocks or anything or criticizing, but identifying the barriers to entry and the challenges, and let's roll up our sleeves and continue making our system better. MedWheels um, was in a very contentious uh, request for offer uh, in 2016. Because of the Sabina ordinance, the city requested that a request for offer be done with a subcontract percentage. The prime company said, we're not going to do it, we're not going to do it. The community stood behind MedWheels, and because of the fact that we finally challenged it, Ray Sedani said, go to the audit review committee, they said, we're going to rebid the contract. The contract ended up being rebid. As a result of that, our company got the contract in June of 2017. The value of the contract was $886,000. I got a list of all these 90-day supply. My company had to go buy $145,000 of inventory. I had to buy it and store it inside of my warehouse. At the end of that one year, I looked at my inventory and I said, what the heck, it's not turning. Does anybody know what that means? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it's not turning. How come it's not turning? So I requested a meeting with the city, and it turns out um, that the city came back and said, oops, guess what, Jane? We well, don't really need all the inventory that you bought and you have in your warehouse. We actually need to buy 
out of uh, all the inventory that we've got from 145,000, we're gonna lock it down to 140 grand. And that was in July of uh, 2019. So if you guys turn to the second page, what I wanna highlight for you here, and again, I use this as an example. Because at the end of the day, even though this contract was an effort for me to create jobs on the east side, for me to scale up, to use this as an example for other cities, and in return, actually, it could have bankrupt me. Good thing that I had a strong balance sheet, because if I didn't have a strong balance sheet, I would have been bankrupt. Yes. Time's up? It's time. Okay. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for So yeah, from Azteca. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Cecilia with Azteca Designs. In reference to uh, the local preference points, local preference points have permitted subcontractors to graduate to primes. I'm a prime example as well. Swimbies are operating <coughs> as primes, which has created additional challenges such as Med Wheels being able to acquire a contract that she just stated. And also with Azteca Designs also obtaining <coughs> several contracts, not only with the airport, but with the city of San Antonio um, and other uh, agencies. Points, um, elimination of the local preference points for architects and engineers. It is important that we work together to better improve these opportunities for job growth and economic value. In the case of Med Wheels, the community celebrated a milestone by debundling initiative. However, one year, one year into the contract, it put a major financial strain to the business. Let's work together to fix these issues. City of San Antonio, y'all are not here to put us out, out of business, but here to create business so we can then create job growth. So we must stand together, united we stand, to pave the way for better opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Janini Castillo. Janini. Hi, everyone. My name is Janine Castillo. Um, I'm a graduate student here and I'm a reporting professional as well. Um, also, I, I, I also attended the last SBAC meeting. Um, and at the last SBAC meeting, I asked questions about the San Antonio EDF. Um, what answers can the Economic Development uh, Foundation provide? For the city cannot condone the, con the exclusion of two important groups of people, black business owners and Asian, and Asian business owners, which creates a visible case system in the seventh largest U.S. city. Can this group take a vote to recommend no more city dollars be spent with the SA EDF until an acceptable answer is provided to the citizens group? Can the, can the, and the city EDF asked for the executive director and chairman of the EDF to report on the problem at the next expat meeting in January. Um, and lastly, where are our taxpayer dollars going and supporting this and supporting the EDF? Thank you. I think it's Albert D. Fernandez Jr. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> right. There have been a lot of people that have said some wonderful things, and I, I want to do this quickly and, and not reiterate those points because I believe that they covered it very well. I'm a small business owner. I've always been a small business owner uh, and a landscape architect, and it's uh, C of Z group. And we do consulting with the city of San Antonio, with the state and the county, and federal jobs, sometimes. Um, what we like about this, and I'll be quick about this, is that we get to be, or we get to have the opportunity to be primes. That's very important for me, because then I run through the process. Oftentimes, as a sub, we end up a year and a year and a half off before our work starts and even longer in some cases. So that's a, a disadvantage. We're getting work that's gonna be good in two years rather than in two months. Um, the other thing that happens, unfortunately, is that we get scoped out of a lot
lot of these projects. It goes to primes and big primes, and the subs get scoped out uh, in discussions with the city and with various agencies about how we can stretch those dollars. So we end up losing a lot of work that way. And that becomes an issue. I think that you cannot look at this as a short-term fix at all. Two years and we're all of a sudden we're going to do well. That is just beyond uh, what I think is proper and appropriate for a program that really does want to do these good things in SBEC, you all are great. I mean, and so is Sabetta. But that is how we need to sustain our, our businesses, our small businesses. Many of us don't want to become big businesses. Had I wanted to do that, I would have worked for a big business and hoped to climb within the corporate ladder. But I don't. And I need to know that I'm going to be able to sustain this and have a profitable business when I retire and sell. So that's a really big issue for, I think, a lot of us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brenda Johnson, the Great Associates. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Vickery Johnson. I'm President and CEO of Vickery Associates. Um, we are a prime contractor. We have uh, participated in the program for many years. Um, it's, I, I feel that I want to mirror um, what Albert said. I think everybody here has said a lot of great things today about, very, about various things that are really important. I'm not going to reiterate those. But I will say this is the second time that this same issue has come up. And unfortunately for my very own industry. Um, and the last time, uh, under open records, it was discovered that the disparity study was incorrect. The numbers were wrong, and the ordinance was pulled by Ms. Cheryl Scully, our city manager, and these rules did not go forward. So this is time number two, okay? So I haven't seen data. I don't know what the data looks like. I, I haven't done an open records request, uh, but it is, a, it is very, very complicated and tedious how they go through these calculations, and that data has to be looked at in detail in order to determine if the success that is being described by the city has in, in reality really occurred. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it has, maybe it has not. Uh, but I do know that it has to be looked at very carefully. The Supreme Court legislation that was cited in the letter by ACEC actually has a Supreme Court issued opinion that says that that legislation does not apply to affirmative action programs. So for the city to even base this decision on something on that legislation and that that's just a threat by the ACEC to uh, eliminate uh, WMDs from the program. Um, I just feel like that uh, the city has not, inter has not even talked to the MWBEs, has not allowed them an opportunity to respond, uh, that being the worst violation, but also the AIA or CBAC. Um, I just ask that um, as we move forward that the data be provided, and uh, I have a list of about 15 or 20 questions of which I'm not going to go into all those questions now because I will wait until after the presentation to submit additional questions. However, there are many. <laughs> and the information that has been provided is extremely vague. So we're looking forward to this presentation and moving forward. I still think it is, I just, to say that 62% of all architect and engineering con uh, fees that have been contracted <coughs> by this city have gone to uh, minority and women-owned businesses, for me, is just absolutely hard and extremely difficult to understand that calculation. Um, so that's, that's, those are my comments, and I do appreciate all of the work that all of you do at this uh, committee. I know it takes a lot of your time and a lot of time away from your businesses, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, that was the last um, citizen to be heard. Um, I want to thank the citizens for all coming out and uh, providing us with your perspective on the various issues in which you brought forward. Uh, none of those issues are easy issues, and I know that during the course of our 
meeting and future meetings, we're going to focus on uh, these concerns. Uh, I, I believe that um, we do have uh, in our agenda uh, the opportunity to go through uh, some of the, the details as it pertains to um, the A and E uh, uh, piece. Um, I also heard uh, two people uh, to address the, um, the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation piece, and um, I don't believe at this time we have a response on that. No, no, we don't. Um, and I'll also say on the record, I've been one of the people who have been um, strongly opinionated about uh, the EDF and its lack of inclusion of African American chambers or Asian chambers. And so um, again, we'll go back to um, our mayor and our city manager to understand uh, those questions. I, I did take down a couple of the questions that were asked. Um, and I'll make sure that I follow back up with the city staff to make sure that those questions get back to um, our uh, decision makers. Uh, the other issue uh, was of uh, med wheels, and um, that issue uh, really pertained, and after looking at this handout, um, I, I, I would ask the city if we could have the fire chief to come to the next SBAC meeting to tell us more so about the contract um, that was established with Med Wheels, um, the before and the after, so we can kind of understand better about the, these numbers, you know, and why the city could not uh, fulfill its uh, contract with Med Wheels in this way. To me, um, again, it's one of those opportunities where we can learn, so perhaps there's a different perspective that we haven't heard, but I think that we do need to flesh it out with the department uh, to make sure that departments acting in good faith of what they said they were going to do and, um, and we'll move forward with that, that item as well because the time does not permit us to address that within this meeting all right um, for for the past back um, what do you have uh, regarding the citizens have you heard anything do you any of you have any comments this is, uh, this is reform. I would request that you submit those questions on planning the support of district four. Your questions are not falling on deaf ears. They're valid. Just at the moment, we can't address them all. I did like your recommendation. That was something that kind of perked my ears about ceasing funds because of the decision that was made. However, I would highly recommend you submit those questions and comments so that they can't they are something that can be referred to and on record. Um, being proactive is something that we do need you to be. And um, again, we will. We take what we do very seriously, and it does not fall into here. So I highly recommend submit those questions, your comments, because I don't want them to say you know, it wasn't addressed. And that is merely just to make sure that we do not have a misinterpretation, because that is the one thing we want to have. Is, Clarity for you. Randy, do you have anything? No, I appreciate you guys coming out and talking with us. And it helps educate me on what's going on out in the community. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think, from my opinion, since I might reach out to the seven, is I, I love the engagement and people attending the meetings, but it also is very helpful for you to reach out to the representatives who live in the area or the district. I mean, in general, you can address them to any of us. But, um, the more information we have, the more we can bring up different issues. Um, I'm appreciative of entrepreneurs have taken the time to be out here. And I can't stress how important enough it is to have voices, especially from people who have first time contracts that impact that, to come and speak. Because those are the people it's affecting. So. Hearing from individuals who, and again, have been referenced in annual reports, who like they just got a contract last year or what? I, I want to hear more from them and how it affects. So the door is open. Um, SBAC is always open to the public. We invite you to continue to be engaged and to reach out to the representatives. I think we have a continual growing concern, and, and we go through the numbers. We we, we try to poke holes in in, um, in everything and, and have a, an understanding. 
but also if, if there's something that seems not completely right, like with uh, med wheels, of understanding the documentation and this has happened and, you know, it doesn't, I've, I've got questions of my own. Um, this is this is the place to do that, so thank you. Thank you, and just to clarify, when, when you're talking about the, um, the companies that were cited in the annual reports that were highlighted as receiving first-time contracts, are we talking about the A&E uh, uh, first-time uh, sure. WBEs? Yeah, so if we look at, if you look at, the city does a great job, or the EDD group does a great job of putting out an annual report, and so all that's online. And so if anyone wants to review the data, the information, it's very robust. And there is also uh, stories of how that impacts particular people. So like for architect engineering, you've got Leonard Young with Young Professional Resources who's been, who's, who states that in 13 years he's been in business, it's been beneficial, this beta has been beneficial. But these first time contracts um, in the last year, these are 12 Swimbies who received their first contract from the city. So I see that Lopez Salas, Med Wheels, Longhorn Propane, um, SJ and J Solutions as well. Um, those are the individuals I think I'd like to hear more from. And I think if we can encourage or maybe do some particular outreach because those voices are important. Thank you. Steven Gonzalez. Well, uh, again, Steve Gonzalez, District 9. Uh, I've been following this for a long time since I am in the A&E industry. Um, this, so my job is, uh, is, is, for the company I work for, is to look at after all solicitations, city, county, state, federal. Um, when, it, when it particularly comes to city, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of projects that I, that myself with our leadership go through and we determine what where we better fit on a project either as a prime or as a sub so there's a, there there are some there are some uh, projects that are on the that are on the fence that we can either prime or sub some are way too large for us because I, I do work for a small business uh, that that we just we, we try to use utilize our talents to sub on but then there's some that we definitely should prime on. And then, like I said, the ones that are on the middle, sometimes those points really do add value to, to us to get us towards more priming than subbing on those. So, you know, um, uh, my, my company is, is involved with ACNC, ACC, so I knew that this was coming down the pike. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that, it, that, it, that it's, that it's this way right now. Uh, hopefully, I'll learn more about the presentation and the data. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll, hopefully, I'll say more after the presentation. Okay, thank you, Sue. Sue Pang. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm a small business owner, and I totally feel your pain and understand where you're coming from. And I, I do want to commend you being brave and speak up and share. So uh, keep doing what you do. And um, we, we will try to help and make this better, hopefully. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Michael Hall. Me too, being a small business owner, I understand exactly where you guys are coming from. Um, uh, I'm a small business owner, so I can relate. And I can also relate to Juanita, what you had said. So uh, appreciate you guys coming down here and, and, and here let us hear you out and being a long time member of this board I can pretty much guarantee you and promise you that we're gonna we're gonna work harder to try to to try to accommodate all this because the bottom line of the whole thing is we're here to create business not eliminate business right. and being a small business doesn't take much to eliminate a business right. when you're a small business so I just want to guarantee you guys that we're gonna do everything we can uh, to make sure that we're doing the best to be fair to everybody so that everybody can appreciate and relate to the city because it is a joint venture. It's not something that SBAC can just take over and say, okay, do this, do that. But the city has got to understand that small businesses sometimes are one paycheck away from going out of business. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a small business. 
And I want to make sure that everybody understands that we are going to do everything we possibly can. And I do appreciate everyone coming out here speaking. And we're, 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 going, to, we're, going, to, we're going to go to work. And I can, I can promise you that. Thank you for coming. Okay, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michael Sendon to address the uh, area of architecture. Sure, so for those who have the agenda in front of you, we are, this was listed as item D, so we're just going to move it up to take it on the first one, and then we'll take the remaining items proceeding after this one. So first and foremost, thank you all for coming here uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate the time you all put in, just like SBAC. We love hearing the feedback from our local small minority women in the business community. Many of y'all have seen, not only in this room today, but throughout our different uh, conferences and things that we attend. So as always, really appreciate your feedback. So today, for this specific item, what we're addressing is the Sabata utilization results that we've been seeing in our architecture and engineering industry only. Um, and we wanted to walk through some of that data today. And as always, you know, we are advocates in our office. We have a group that works day in and day out to look, utilize our local small minority <coughs> business community. So when this success story came up that could result in a dial back of the program, we really wanted to dive into the data to try to make sure and identify any possible gaps that there might be. Right? Is there something we have in a turn that <coughs> might still be able to justify application of points or something of that nature? So diving in. As, we'll sure. It. For those of you who have questions, please hold them to the end so that way we can actually get through the whole process, uh, the whole presentation. And make note, not that we're not wanting to hear it, but it'll allow us to actually process the entire presentation first. It's a recommendation I would make, please. John, you move. So to kick it off, as you all recall, we've been engaged with the Sebeda program since back in the early 2010. Oh, go ahead. Okay, a couple things. Um, so the first point of order is that typically our meetings end at 1 o'clock. And so I would like to have a motion from the board member to extend our meeting time. And even if board members have to uh, leave, we're not making any decisions. Uh, so we can go into information, uh, informational session uh, without you know, compromising the information that needs to be conveyed. Uh, so that would be my first request. The second is I really uh, would love to hear I guess from everybody in the room, but I really need to enable the SBAC members to be able to ask the questions to the staff because that is our, our existing uh, process uh, and I just can't have everyone asking questions. So again, uh, I'll ask the SBAC members to be able to facilitate questions to the staff as appropriate and we will be responsible back to uh, those who have appointed us. Okay? Hey, Chris, just so you, know, you won't need a uh, motion to extend the meeting. Thank you. Okay, very good. So let's proceed. Thank you. Thank you all for the clarification. So back into this again, reviewing the Sabate application uh, in the architecture and engineering industry, um, the success we've had. So as you all recall, it have been a part of this since back in early, before even 2010, uh, the Sabate program went through a major overhaul that became effective in 2011. And that overhaul really changed the way in which the city went about utilizing our local small minority women-owned businesses on our city contracts at the prime contracting level, and in the all case consultant level and sub-consultant level. And in the architecture and engineering industry, we really have three primary tools in which we go about that driving of utilization. The first one is on discretionary contracts. We can apply up to 20 Sabeta prime evaluation points. Uh, for those of y'all who aren't familiar with what that means, uh, on discretionary contracts, they are typically graded like a test, meaning the one who scores the highest out of a scale of 100 points typically wins that contract. And the criteria is made up of qualifications, which is heavy in the architecture and engineering industry, proposed plan, and then of course your Sabata points. And that's up to 20, it is a range. Um, and they apply to small and small minority women owned businesses. And I'll get into this piece in just a second underneath it. We also were able to apply sub-consulting goals to our architecture and engineering contracts. Uh, we can apply up to 40% to each project, depending on the scope of work of that project, 
and who's available in our central vendor registry to set those goals. That's been very effective. And then in 2016, through the last amendment process, our city council uh, uh, approved the ability to set mentorship requirements on architecture and engineering contracts. And what that does is we apply those on kind of your higher dollar value, high profile projects where the winner of that project has to enter our city's mentor protege program and give back to another small minority woman on business to teach them better business practices. So before I move off this slide, on the evaluation preference points, we applied them in this industry, even though there is a Texas state statute, code 2254, that governs the procurement of architecture and engineering services. And it states that prime consultants for architecture and engineering services should be solely made on a firm's competence and qualifications. And that's probably why a lot of y'all haven't seen the veteran-owned preference points applied to these solicitations ever or the local preference points ever applied to architecture and engineering solicitations. You've just traditionally seen those Sabata points. Those other two programs have not been able to apply to those solicitations because of that state statute. However, we were able to do so through the Croson decision that laid out very clear rules on how you can have these type of programs. And it said that if you can prove that there is disparity in your local marketplace, which is why we do disparity studies and annual reports so frequently, if you can prove that there is disparity and you can develop a tool that is narrowly tailored to address that disparity, you can override that state and local law. So regardless of it being there, we checked the box back in 2010 disparity study that showed we still had disparity. And we've been checking the boxes since then up until a certain cutoff point, which we'll get into, that still show disparity. So that is why you have traditionally seen the Sabata points apply to these projects, regardless of that state statute, and why you don't see something like a veteran on preference points or a local preference points. So let's dig into the results of this program. So we've obviously uh, been measuring this um, frequently, often daily, weekly, and that's you know a testament to what one citizen member brought up of some of those data concerns back before 2010 when this disparity study happened at that time. We have a very robust process now in which we have, which we capture payments to our local minority women-owned businesses that's a little more real time. So since then, we've been tracking payments to these, to minority and women-owned businesses to see how well they're doing in relation to their availability in our local marketplace. So to set some context, I wanna just walk everybody through this chart so that it's kind of easy to understand and read. And what we're going to start with first is kind of our basis in, in, which we, in which the goal we're trying to meet. And that's this blue bar down here. This blue bar represents the availability of local minority and women-owned businesses um, in the San Antonio marketplace that are, that are wanting to perform or can perform architecture and engineering type services. These are the folks that can do it. It's kind of taken a little dip here, and that's through some programmatic decisions. And the reason for the most current uptick is that prior to the last disparity study that was adopted in December of 2015, the city considered availability who is registered in the city's central vendor registry, can perform architecture and engineering services, and is certified by the South Central Texas Regional Certification Agency as an architecture and engineering firm. <coughs> that is how that number as of 2015 was derived, and that was our goal. However, through the work with SBAC and the community, we realized that just those who are registered with us doesn't mean that's all the folks in the community who could do business with us. That's not really our true goal of where we want to be. Those folks who haven't registered with us, maybe there's a reason for that. We should still include them in our goal of what we want to meet, simplify processes, you name it. A lot of the things our five-year diversity action plan seeks to accomplish to get those folks in our system and be utilized on our projects. So that's the availability marker. The next three markers you see on this slide represent availability, just broken down in different ways. And the first one is we'll start with this kind of tannish orange bar that is representing all minority and women-owned businesses, regardless of at the prime consultant or sub-consultant level, that receive the actual physical dollar in that given time frame. So that, as you saw, the need for that 2011 overhaul and 
why we really needed to put a program in place that was stronger in architecture and engineering. The next bar we want to look at is prime level utilization in architecture and engineering. And you'll see it took this dip and then when the 2011 ordinance was put in place, we had an uptick in those businesses. And the last bar on here, the sub-consultant bar, we really started tracking that individually in 2014. Um, and you'll see that that's also had a steady incline. The only reason you see a dip here is if you all recall, during the 2016 amendment process, the small minority women-owned business community asked if they could self-perform sub-consulting goals. So what does that mean? So when we set up, let's just hypothetically throw out a 30% minority women-owned business goal that a prime consultant must meet, if another minority women-owned business won it, back in the day, they still had to find another to sub it to. And a lot of them came forward to us and said, that really hurts our ability to build our capacity. If we have the ability to self-perform, we need to try to do as much as we can when we win these contracts. <coughs> so as a result, we now allow them to self-perform as long as they possess the exact certifications of the subcontracting goal. And so some folks took advantage of that. As you see, some of the stuff retained at the prime level, and it dipped a little bit because some folks took advantage of that. Now, to declutter this chart really quickly, I did. I just want to high level show you. This is the overall one with availability there. This is the prime one we discussed second. You see that uptake and take off there, and then last, the subconsulting one we just discussed. So I just want to declutter it so you all can take a quick look at it. So we kind of paused here when we've been seeing this really success since 2014. And when we were starting to think about how we were going to dial back the program to, meet, to have parity with these goals, we wanted to make sure we were uncovering any potential gaps in the data there may be. Because it's great to look at numbers overall, as you all know, even dissection by prime and sub. But we wanted to take an even deeper look at that. And so we looked at these various data sets to ensure that there was no disparity seen with either these different ethnicities, genders, different valuations of contracts, and things of that nature. So the first thing we did is we said, okay, that overall data set are African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Native Americans receiving their parity, are they getting a fair share of dollars from the city of San Antonio in relation to availability? And the box checked yes. It checked yes for all but Native Americans. They are about 1% efficient. And quite frankly, um, it's hard for us to set goals for these businesses. There's not a lot registered in our central vendor registry. So that's a call to action that if you know they're out there, they need to be registered with us in order to set tools for them. Are a part of that narrowly tailored process that, that we talked about earlier. Um, for women-owned businesses, they as well. Hey Michael, can I just, um, since you used this terminology before, just to clarify, in each of the ethnicities, utilization was exceeding the availability similar Correct. to the charts you were showing. Correct. And for some context to that, our annual reports publish this every time. We can pull that up if we need to. It, it lists out exactly the percentage in which we're paying the firms in relation to their availability and very nice bar charts that we'd be glad to, to walk through with you all if you wanted to. So ethnicities, gender for women-owned businesses, I believe they are utilized at 28% and their availability is at 8% in this industry. Michael. Hi. Yes, sir. So please explain for the audience because they may not understand about double counting. So for instance, when you talk about WBEs and you just went through the ethnicity or race areas, um, the people who are in the category of ethnicity are not counted in the gender box of WBE. Right. right. Okay. So that's what you need to say. That's a great point. So, yeah, that's may great. I clarify that? Is that so that your the gender WBE is just gender only, and that's 8%. Right, we don't double count. We try to have uh, transparency in our numbers, so. Um, and this is just for prime contracts. And that's 8% available. This is total. We checked it overall at the prime and sub-level uh, for these businesses. So yeah, to, to Chris's point, we don't double count. So if you're a <coughs> African-American women-owned business, um, we don't put you in both categories, so you're shooting up the numbers on both ends. 
uh, you would apply the African American category there and not that double count. Another thing I wanted to clarify that I don't think I did earlier is when I talk about measuring against architect city architecture and engineering solicitations, it are, it's all contracts to city issues outside of those in which federal dollars apply because at that point the federal, the federal government has a DBE program that would apply to those solicitations. They happen very infrequently. It's usually all city dollars that we do, but it's all the city dollars um, for architecture engineering services that we're talking about here. So it's not a subset, it is the entire uh, grouping. So for high profile contracts, one another piece we wanted to look at is, okay, are the minority women owned business community locally receiving the lower level contracts? Or are they receiving even the ones we consider high profile, which are those that are discretionary, which is every architecture and engineering contract, over a million dollars, or those of high community interest. Those are the ones that you know are, are, are really difficult or perceived difficult for small businesses to obtain. And through the data we pulled, um, we found that there really wasn't much of a decline. There was still exceeding availability um, on those high profile contracts. So there wasn't too much of a dip in the numbers we saw there. We also thought, okay, we're grouping architecture and engineering solicitations together, right? A and E. What happens if you break those apart, right? Let's start in. Let's start reviewing those data sets individually. Maybe, maybe engineers are struggling more than architects, and so maybe we should just tailor the tools to engineers or something of that nature. And again, the data <coughs> proved out that for each ethnicity, for each gender, <coughs> prime and sub, um, most all were. Um, and being utilized greater than their availability in the marketplace. The one down here we wanted to measure was we wanted to verify that those percentages that are increasing, those dollar values that are increasing, is it also increasing amongst the number of minority women-owned businesses on our city contracts, right? Because that's all great if your percentages and dollar values are increasing, but if it was five vendors participating seven years ago, and it's five businesses participating now, good for those five, but we really wanted to spread it amongst more. And our data showed that wasn't the case. I believe it was 12 or 14 minority women-owned businesses in 2011 that were utilized on our city contracts, and in 2017 it was around 50. So we were, not, we were glad to see that not only was that trend of dollar value and percentages increasing, but more firms were taking advantage of the tool. And then the last thing we wanted to measure was kind of a scenario. Because um, obviously the recommendation here, as you've all pointed out, is the removal at this time of the Sebeda evaluation points on these contracts. So staff went through all of the architecture and engineering contracts between 2014 and 2017, and they know who got awarded what, they know who bid and who got scored what. They knew the scoring criteria and, and the Sebeda points applied, and they ran a little scenario that just said, what happens if we were to take these 20 points and reduce it down 15, 10, all the way down to zero, right? That should be some level of analysis to show what effect it would have on that community. Would, would the awards have flipped or something of that nature? And we were really proud when looking at that data because that's really a testament to the architecture and engineering community we were seeing that these businesses were winning contracts without the need of the points in those three years. So much to the fact that of that 62% utilization that I showed earlier of minority women-owned businesses, had we have reduced those points down to zero, our utilization would have only dropped by 2.89 percentage points on those projects, meaning they were winning based on their qualifications, which is very positive. That is what we ultimately wanted to see through this program. So this is the data we poured over. Um, it, it was a pretty extensive effort, but as I mentioned, we did that because we are advocates for you all. We really wanted to make sure we were thorough in this decision-making process, because if a gap arose, was there an ability to address that gap? So as a result, um, we have constructed, so we don't, just for y'all's just for y'all's knowledge, our office actually does not set the tools. Um, on our city projects. Our, we have the program in place and the infrastructure, but we recommend them to a goal setting committee. And we are instructing the goal setting committee to apply no Cebeda prime evaluation points on architecture and engineering contracts. That's kind of per that state law I just told you about earlier. 
and the fact that in Croson, you know, you have to prove there's disparity, and we haven't seen that. And, and another thing is, some have asked, why now? You know, if you've seen this overutilization since 2014, why now? And our answer is, we want to see trends. I don't want to see success in one year and make decisions that could impact something that was a fluke uh, based on one contract, kind of you name it. We wanted to see a steady number of years in place where we saw success before such a decision was made. So in doing so, when we apply no points to these contracts, we're proposing, I think someone said it here already, quarterly evaluations of what happens to those projects when we do this. Because regardless of what our scenario says, we want to see that happen in real time. When we apply no points, do small minority women-owned business primes still win these contracts, right? Are they still bidding at the rates they were? And so to accommodate this, and, and, and if those quarterly evaluations show that we take a negative decline in utilization, we have the ability to ramp back and reapply those Sabata points to those architecture engineering solicitations in the future. That's what's gonna be presented to SBAC quarterly. And we're actually gonna do a pretty thorough process, so we're not gonna lump in all architecture and engineering contracts together. We're gonna, because obviously there's gonna be a mix for a little while of some with points and without. We'll pull them apart and kind of look at those that didn't have points as a subset to get an understanding of where we're going and if a negative impact will likely happen. And Michael, this is a, this is a new, um, process that we'll be going through because we've never, never had this type of issue before. 100%. Yeah, we consulted with Franklin Lee, helped us develop this program. He's a national expert. Unfortunately, he did not know of another community that was experiencing this. So yes, it is new for us. And that's why we wanted to pour through as many data sets as possible in making the decision. Now, real quick, this doesn't require any type of Sabeta amendment. It was designed this way since 2011. It applies to contracts based on the degree of disparity and availability of firms in the marketplace. And so when there's a lot of disparity, we obviously apply it very aggressively, right? We try to go as far as we can and place the maximum tools, the maximum weight to achieve the maximum results. And when availability or when disparity is not seen, we have the ability to dial back. That was always part of the Sabeta program. And so as mentioned, if we see a negative result, we'll dial back. Now, we are going to recommend that sub-consulting goals for minority women-owned businesses still apply to architecture and engineering solicitations for now. We don't want to turn all the tools on and all the tools off. Let's deal with the one that's addressed, that's, that's tied to a state statute, and then still apply sub-consulting goals with mentorship requirements to keep building up our local businesses and see how that impacts utilization. And one small note I wanted to just place at the bottom. This only impacts our architecture and engineering industry at this time. We have not, unfortunately, seen these results in the other industries we measure, professional services, construction, other services, and goods and supplies. So we want to see that in the other ones. So just a level set, it is just in architecture and engineering services. Michael, so, uh, because the, the, the data was uh, challenged by a couple of the speakers, citizens is it possible to um, to you know, provide us uh, with a list of those firms so we can see you know what we're counting as being part of this database subset and then you know, and, and then look at the you know the impacts sure from there. that's a good point too uh, we have so much clarifiers around the data and I want to make sure people understand so if we count someone as a local minority went on business while well, we'll show you uh, they have to be local, right? Not every program does that, meaning they have to be headquartered here or have a significant business presence in our marketplace. Uh, they have to be certified. We can't count someone who is not actually certified by the South Central Texas Regional Certification Agency. So they meet those two criteria. We're allowed to count them, and we'll be glad to show you that data. Um, Chris, do you mind if I yes. give my perspective on that? <clears throat> the one thing I wanted to highlight is um, Pulled up on the overall utilization is um, well, first of all, Councilwoman Chan is still here. She remembers this. She was one of the councilwomen in in place to put this uh, whole ordinance together. Uh, and Brenda was part of that group when we discovered some of the uh, inaccuracies 
way back over here. Uh, the reality is I was the assistant director. I was in Michael's position when we created Total uh, Sabata program. I was hired by Shell to kind of come in and, and revamp it because I was experiencing some problems. Uh, one of my frustrations is um, the fact that um, this is an extremely uh, positive story and that's kind of getting lost in, in sort of the discussion. Uh, we're extremely pleased to see that, you know, beginning before we overhauled the program, how low utilization was and how now, even when you remove the points, the small minority women owned businesses are competing. That's been the whole goal of this program from day one. And as Michael mentioned, that should be celebrated and commended by the a and &E community, in particular by the minority women owned businesses. And so um, people have kind of called me, called Michael, and said, you know, how, you know, who's watching this? How can you all be doing this? Uh, I just want to make it clear, this office, this committee, is designed to be your advocates. We are the ones that are most concerned if there are going to, if there is going to be a, a take a dip. We are the ones that take pride in the success of the program and don't want to see that end. So to say that we're going to be monitoring very closely is an understatement. Obviously, as we've seen success, we don't want to see this dip down. So I just wanted to provide that assurance that in a lot of ways, we are that voice. And the infrastructure to kind of ensure that you know we stay on track, that this is all transparent, is here built in within, within the SPAC. There is no other program that has a council appointed committee overseeing a specific program. So these are all these are all in place. So uh, just a, an assurance on the monitoring side. You know, me personally and Michael overseeing this, we don't want to see this go down. As a matter of fact, we'd like to see all of the different industries experiencing this same success. But I say that knowing that uh, the concern is valid. If I was a small business and I knew those points were there and I saw them being eliminated, I, could, I, I completely understand. But just from an assurance standpoint, we want to see you all continue to win uh, these contracts without the points. I think the subcontracting goal is getting missed also um, on these bigger projects. It's the subcontracting goals that have provided you small businesses, you small minority women owned businesses, access to these contracts. That's going to continue, and that capacity building is going to continue so that you can uh, compete as a prime. I just wanted to add about my two cents in. And, 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 and so do I. Can I say something too from TCI? Okay. Chair, so one, two. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, Bonnie Disciplina from District 4. The one thing I wanted to um, make reference is something that Michael made a statement about local and that your, um, that your, registered here? No, that your, your headquarters is actually housed here. I make reference to that because it was brought up at one point, you know, open small businesses throughout, outside of Bear County and other cities. We made sure that we emphasized that you were headquartered here and that it was brought up to our attention to make sure that it was brought to the forefront, forefront about being a woman minority owned business. So your, your statements as far as, or questions about making sure that we advocate and continue to voice them, that's one thing that we did stay firm on, is making sure that the headquarters are here and that it is within the, center, the, the county first before it's even opened out to anyone else. Sure. So I appreciate the overview. I do have questions, as I'm sure many of y'all do. So the first is I'll say um, I was here working in EDD when we did the disparity study. So I have a unique perspective. And also being an entrepreneur on this side of the house, I can understand now both sides. When we did talk to Franklin, Franklin had a great analogy when we were going through the process. And what he said is, when you look at this type of program and remedying discrimination, you have to think of it as having a patient who has diabetes. And so for that, when you give insulin, you have to maintain a dosage. But when um, you can't think, oh, he's great, because now and you take away the insulin and, oh, he's going to do fine, he's going to do better. You have to maintain that insulin level or that medication in order to continue to remedy that particular issue of, of 
you know, that, that white disparity. So I'm, I cheer on that we've exceeded and done well, and I understand where the 31 and the 43 are with regards to like your overutilization, that's great. A lot of good first-time contracts. People have been knocking on that door who are now uh, involved in, in winning contracts. But the growing concern for me, there's two. The first is where that gap is between the 31 and the 63 and the utilization, because we did a really good job, I thought, of going beyond the central vendor registry where people have to be registered and saying, oh, there's people in chambers who are not registered. And so we gathered all that and the availability increased. Now that wasn't something that they needed to do, but they did it because they thought that was in the in spirit of fairness. So I was happy to be a part of that team. But I'll say, I'm, I'm really interested to see, kind of Chris's point, who's impacted as a small business owner within that realm, and is this, how, I'm trying to justify where the gap is. So if you're telling me there's only 31% availability, but we got 63 utilization, then where are we missing? Like what, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where, like do we not count enough? Are there more people that are getting registered? So, so that's my, my first question. The second is when we look at the utilization comparison <coughs> over the last like 2011 to 2017, overall we've only grown to 20, a 24% increase over across all areas. So if we're doing well in architectural engineering and maybe the pressure is coming from non-minority businesses who feel that that's unfair and that are citing statute, I'm concerned, what happens, who's next? Is it construction? Because they're doing pretty well. Or is it goods and services? And is, is there statute that is impacted that we've kind of gone around because we've been able to show that there's disparity, right? Because my concern is once we start saying okay, we, we're not gonna give prime points, but you can still subcatch, you can have a small piece of the pie, but you can't own the whole pie. You can divvy out, or let's be in this venture state, and we, we move away from where we were with regards to self-performance, then what industry is next that may be a target for that kind of rationale? Great, great points, and um, I'm gonna go to the city staff, uh, PCI. Well, if you all wanna answer that, that's fine. I mean, what, I just wanted to bring up is we are in TCI, and TCI um, and my division, we oversee all of the architecture um, contracts, engineering contracts, and all of the solicitations and everything. And first off, we want to really commend EDD and all of our architectures and engineers because um, this success is something that TCI is incredibly proud of and excited about. And it also is one of those things that we are committed to um, continuing. And so we're going to be watching just as closely as EDD is in conjunction and partnership with them and watching and seeing if, if this is decreasing because it is so important to GCI that we continue to have our small businesses and our minority and women owned businesses as part of our architecture and engineering community. So that's all I wanted to say. I mean, just to answer your question directly, and, and Troy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the state statute that kind of governs how we procure the limited to qualifications is really only based in architecture and engineering services, and there's some professional services um, solicitations. Outside of that, I think just construction, you don't have those level of um, strictness to the process, and then I think in other services and goods and supplies, um, it's also dictated differently. So really just architecture and engineering as a whole, and maybe a piece of how professional services is uh, procured. And that's a great point, because there's a chance that we could still, similar to your veterans own preference program and your local preference program, that if that statute wasn't there, you still might be able to apply like small business plans. And I think it's worth uh, clarifying that EDD is not in charge of local preference, nor the veterans program. So those are separate. <coughs> So um, my eyes are kind of glossing over um, because I'm still I'm getting lots of text messages right now from the people who are in the room because they still want to know more about this issue of transparency. And, and so this issue of transparency we're going to address um, because as a chair of SBAG, at some point I was aware of some of the, the conversations about this um, legal issue pertaining to A&E. Now with that said, 
during the time in which it was brought to my attention, we were also fighting like heck to get our diversity action plan approved by council. We also have had a about a three month uh, review now of the finance uh, procurement preference programs, which they want to get our input on. So to be very, to be very transparent about it, there was nothing that was, um, I guess, provided to me or provided to the SBAC that was lost in the, in the interpretation that we just dropped the ball. We didn't just drop the ball. The fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of different high level issues in which were being worked by the SBAC. And so I apologize if that came across as the SBAC not being on its toes. I will say that the letter when Grace Rose provided it to me was the first time that I had saw that letter. And so to that point, what we have been discussing is the fact that since this is the very first industry, the very first category that was uh, requested to, to be rolled back or to be suspended with applying points, I said, what is the process moving forward? Because as you've alluded, we're going to have not only this issue with A&E, but we may have it in construction, we may have it in professional services. I don't know. We don't know. But the most important thing is that we establish a process that is regular, that's predictable, that you know, we establish an email channel back to the citizens because you know they've been asking, well, why don't we get you know email notifications of this meeting? All right, so we can do more to be more transparent with the agenda that's been posted about what we're doing. Uh, but again, I I don't take as a citizen, I don't take the actions of moving forward with applying the tools in which we had learned about during our disparity studies as being wrong, I just think that it was poor timing. And I wish that the city would have come to the SBAC first to say this is what we're considering doing. Because that's why we're all here. Now we're explaining why the train left the station. Um, now, the other piece that I remember that our attorney Franklin at the time said, he says you have to, as citizens, you have to protect that Cebeda ordinance. Because if you don't, and you have any type of weakness, then your ordinance can be contested and you may lose it. So yeah, I, 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 I understand this notion that we may need to go back to the department, EDD, and say, can you consider just um, some of the requests which were to maybe you know, study this a little bit more, don't implement the letter that you sent out, and give uh, the feedback to the city manager so you can all digest what you heard today without truly taking away points on contracts that may sustain some of these emerging companies, these, these companies in which you've already identified. You know, I had another uh, question uh, that I asked to the uh, regional certification agency, uh, and they gave me the example of Brooks. And Brooks uses a dual certification on uh, a &E. So, for instance, you'll have a minority woman, and that's the, that's how they determine uh, disparity. So they, they get uh, they they boil it down a little bit more than just saying WBE. <coughs> um, I know that that will take a lot of rigor and work because our disparity studies have been based on WBE. But is the Brooks model wrong? Would the Brooks model show that we do have disparity uh, with Native American women business enterprise? Um, and then that category would be pushed as a way to uh, get parity. I mean, that, that's a different level of thinking about this issue. Um, so I'm not quite sure if the data, you know, I know that the data had questions uh, from the people here because, again, they want to see the data. They want to understand the data. That's fair. Um, we also know that with that being said, then maybe the question of can we create a task force, which was what Grace Rose had suggested, maybe that's something we go back to the city manager and say, hypothetically, is this something that the city would like to, to entertain? Um, I just want to make sure that these questions that have been asked are properly addressed so at the end of the day, we can say that we address the questions that were provided by the citizens and that we address the concerns of the industry, that we're not being premature in, in the knee-jerk reaction, 
um, uh, maybe you know perhaps uh, catering to an organization or organizations that have have questioned why, why are we doing this and at the end of the day I think that we all want to have the success stories of our small minority women-owned businesses and hopefully we'll also go back to the recommendation from last meeting which is to bring in the local program and the veterans programs under the same citizens umbrella so then that way we can talk apples to apples and, 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 and not be all over the place in terms of these programs uh, I also uh, uh, told uh, our former city councilwoman Alyssa Chan that she would be able to ask a question and I'm going to give my chair privilege to do that. Well, thank you so very much, Chair. My name is Alyssa Chan and I am a small business owner. I am in the AV industry. My husband and I have been working as an engineering firm for 26 years. And I also worked very hard to try to get this uh, small business minority program. And Renee, yes, thank you. Your team has worked with me. And the goal is to level the playing field. And I think that uh, and thanks all the members on NSPAC for your time. I think our goal is the same, is to try to help small minority businesses so that we can compete without being preferential. However, this preferential point, it is critical, I think, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez mentioned, uh, for the small businesses to become a prime. If this chart is shown, and I think that will be a successful story, and I think that's what we should cherish. But I do have some questions about data, and I think Renee, you know that I do have, you know, because I agree that from my experience, um, just by looking at 62%, uh, all city contracts, I think it would be great if I really see the data that over 50% of all revenue went to minority and women owned. But that is something that I just cannot come around with. And I think that data is important. It is possible to share the raw data. Uh, being an engineer, I think we can analyze the data. We don't mind the data. Uh, the second thing is, when you said that there's no double count, how do you decide whether you will count my engineering firm to be a woman or to be a minority? That would be one question. And then also on the availability. And you know, since the disparity study, availability has always been an issue because depending on how you come up with availability, then you can reach the goal or you may not reach the goal. I think that needs to be expanded as well. But at the end of the day, I do agree with the chair that if you wanted to have a policy change, and I, I, my heart is with the small business, I think whenever you want to have a policy change, it's important that we address the concerns that the citizen or the industry has so that everybody can have the buy-in. So I would personally encourage that perhaps we need to go back, let the community see the data, uh, let's see what needs to be done, but instead of rushing and giving an instruction, I think we perhaps need to slow down a little bit. Sometimes slowing down a little bit is actual acceleration, because if you have everybody's buy-in, then we can all come in and celebrate, and then you know uh, be on board. So I would say that I know that in your one of your slides, Renee and, and Mike, I think you are instructing already uh, the goal setting committee to not keep the point. I would say that perhaps we need to review that. Uh, let's talk about it. I'm sure that everybody are looking on the same goal. And then perhaps we do instead of immediately slow down 20 points, maybe we monitor with uh, 10 or 15 or 5, whatever that might be. Another point I want to make is that when, when you mentioned about quarterly monitoring, now the RFQ doesn't issue every quarter. You don't know when the RFQ is going to issue. So one quarter you may have nothing, another quarter you may have a lot. So how do you actually monitor that progress? I think you need to be given some thought. Uh, so those are, I think we still have a lot of things that we need to address and perhaps slowing down will be my recommendation at this time. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Randy. Yeah, um, probably for uh, my understanding the 31% of availability and then going to the 60% utilization, are we looking at the number of businesses in A&E across the city 
in saying that the 31% is the, 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 the minority, and then the 60% is, we're saying that 60% of the money that was spent on projects was went to those, okay? So my question is, of all that 31%, were those broken down and looked at in terms of did half of that money go to one particular portion and then 25% go to another one and 2%? That would be something that I'm interested in knowing about because then you can look at and maybe you're not taking away points from everybody. You give points back to a certain ethnicity or gender. Right. Um, and has that data been boiled down to look at specifically? <coughs> so, yeah. The answer is yes. And, and, and she's okay. But uh, you're bringing these questions up in order for us to come back to you and provide that. So we're, yeah. we're jotting this down so that we can, when Michael went through that chart with the eight, nine boxes, uh, one of the boxes was ethnicity and gender, and that, that's what mm -hmm. you were referring to. But yeah. we're, we're taking these down that way. We can provide you all like with responses to all these questions. Because when that the one top uh, box at the top was saying that yeah we had checked it off, but Native Americans were still deficient. There's still a di disparity. So how many how many are available? Right. So so um, I, I also want to say this. Uh, uh, Ms. Chan says asked a question about how 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 does your certifications work? So when you have your business and you register it and you certify it, you certified it according to the areas that you felt were important. So if you checked off the box, and I did for my school, African American, um, my company's run by you know uh, a woman, so woman, veteran. So we did all those check box. And uh, but when it comes down to the actual application of of uh, uh, what we call ourselves, uh, it always starts at race, is the first um, selection, then it goes to ethnicity, then it goes to gender, and you know, then everything else. Um, and I say that that's the hierarchy. That's not something that uh, the city makes up. That's a hierarchy that is chosen, that you've chosen. So. I have another business that I've chosen not to identify myself as being a whatever. So that business is registered a little bit different than the first business that I have. And again, that's because from a strategy perspective, maybe I think I'll compete better as a veteran uh, than I would as a, a woman. And I'm not a woman, right? But you get my point. So Thanks for the clarification. Those are choices in which we make when we initially register our businesses. And according to the certification agency, if you want to remove <coughs> or add, you can always do that at any time in the lifetime of your business. So that's that's your business, and that's what you have to do. Um, Chris, yeah. so you're saying that's an option. For a woman, you could either go Hispanic or I could go woman. Is that what you're saying? According to the uh, South Regional Certification Agency, yes. You can remove or add a declaration, but remember, in the procurement game, it's always going to be, they're going to look at you first as your race, ethnicity, and then your your gender. So ethnicity trumps gender, to kind of answer Ms. Chan's question. I, I, I'm not so sure if that's the case, because I think, on, I know that Austin, you actually select how you're going to be counted. I don't yeah. think City of San Antonio does, and what? I don't think the certification does. You come in with all your AM <coughs> When we count, uh -huh. when we counted with regards to numbers, like when they say right. WBE and your, and I'll use myself as an example. Right. Um, I'm counted as an HEBE or an MBE. I'm, okay. I, I may have a certification for WBE, okay. but I'm not double counted. I am this. Well, in that case, I will be even more so strong. Well, okay, so it's a WM. Hmm. It's a WM is 60%. So in that words, my firm will always be counted as a minority, not as a Right. Correct. Okay. Okay. I know. No, and that's great clarification. So I think more transparency with regards to education, some of the graphs, the data may be beneficial to go through. I know that we're kind of over, and I know we had different reports and discussions that we're going to going to be discussed. But I think at this point, I would recommend that the uh, business fee waiver and the uh, procurement 
preference program be pushed to the next agenda meeting. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add to the conversation, but I just want to be mindful of time for everyone on, involved. Well, at this point, you can't take action because you don't have a quorum. Correct. So. And I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, right here. Now, I just have, uh, there was one discrepancy in the presentation, and that is it discussed availability as being through the registration, which is six, how many counties? Six, 11? I forget. Um, eight. We like eight. Eight counties. Yeah. Okay, so was, first it was presented that the availability was based upon eight counties. Then it was later presented that the availability was only based on, upon local businesses who have local offices in San Antonio. So those are that's two totally different uh, numbers. I think one of the board members had mentioned that. Okay. The fact that for the Cebada program includes the MSA has always been that way, developed that way, and continues to be tracked that way. So you I think guys she was referencing the local program, yes. so there's a little disconnect there. Right, so the local program, you're only counting uh, women-owned businesses that have a local office here for architects and engineers as available. We count all minority women-owned businesses who are located in the MSA, our Metropolitan Statistical Area. As, a, as that, being available. Right, that have a headquarter or have a significant business presence, which is you've been here for a year and 20% of your employees work out of that local office. But that hasn't changed. That has been that way since 09 or 010, since the state ordinance was developed out. But that's not what you have to have to be certified with the South Central Region. Right. Correct. So, so those numbers are totally different. If you're certified and not local, we won't count you. As being available. Both. You're not available because you're not local, because that's who we're trying to resolve disparity for, and you won't be counted for utilization. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And so there are, if that's the case, then I just want to clarify, there's 32% availability of WBEs. And the there's 31, I think is the number, 31% of minority and women-owned businesses in the as MSA. A whole, as a full class. As a full class okay. that do uh, architecture and engineering services specifically. So you you are lumping the minorities and the women together. They are together. Yeah. But they're not double counted. Right. Okay. Chris, so because we have no form, we can't we can't do any particular action or make recommendations. Is that correct? That's correct. But let me recommend something. We've been taking all this information down, and all the questions down. You know, at, the, at the next meeting, let us provide sort of a report out on sort of all the information. The fact is, from a transparency standpoint, we have a uh, monthly dashboard that gets updated. We have an annual report that goes over the data. We now tie directly to our uh, SAP system that pulls the payment data. So I'm very comfortable with sharing the data, so let us find a way to produce the request that you've had in a, in a simple way and and um, and continue to work out all the questions you all had. Thank you so much. Mike, I, mean, I don't mean to overstep, maybe maybe recommendations you'd have on that, but. I'd be glad to uh, show what we need to show. All right. Well, I, I on this issue of a and &E, I appreciate all of the uh, the input and uh, let's give our city staff you know, the opportunity to uh, to show us you know, uh, what they've come back with. Uh, I have full faith and trust in the economic development department. Yeah, and some of these are great. So, I mean, some of these, to be honest with you, we look for feedback like a process to dial down. This is new phenomena, wasn't addressed prior to that. So right. I hear you loud and clear as these issues bubble up. You know, can we present ideas to us back on? Hey, the next time when we reach these milestones, as we inch closer, can we develop our pro Absolutely, I mean, that makes sense. From a monitoring standpoint, the new phenomena, how are we gonna monitor that? That's all things that we're interested in developing out also. That's the charge of what Michael does. So these are all great suggestions that we think would benefit the uh, SBAC and benefit the program in whole. And I mean, I haven't heard anything here that that concerns me in, in the sense that we need to do a better job communicating and have processes in place. I mean, we're all for that. Process improvement is, is how we operate. Okay. Um, as it pertains to, yes. For clarity, so you're saying we can submit all our concerns and questions to the portal to make sure y'all. Well, to, it's the center of the microphone. Oh, center of me. Yeah. yeah. 
and um, as pertains to uh, your concern with the EDF, uh, again, uh, I would like for the department to go back to the manager to find status. Uh, the mayor told me personally that he was working it and, and give him some time, so giving him some time is about now, so we'd love to have an update. Um, as pertaining to the med wheels issue, uh, I just would like to see if the fire chief can make uh, the opportunity to be on the uh, on the agenda. And we have clarity on when we're meeting uh, next time. Just for yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, so we can actually let's let's jump down now to um, the monthly events on uh, so that way everyone here can be apprised and be aware of the great activities that are happening that the city will be participating in on item number five. Sure. So December, as we kind of wind down toward the holidays, we have kind of two big events happening in the city. They aren't the San Antonio's events, but we're in love to participate in them because there's a lot of great information that can be passed down to our local small minority little business community. The first event is going to be the Bear County Swim Bee Conference. If y'all have never been there, a lot of different exhibitors, uh, organizations show up and it's a great chance for you to go learn what other folks do in, in addition to the city of San Antonio and how they can help your business grow so that's kind of an all-day event December 5th from 7 30 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Freeman Expo Hall and Michael will you be doing a special presentation during that time on behalf of you? we have yes a slew of our city departments show up and we do a variety of different presentations on how to do business with the city of San Antonio thank you for that reading. Um, also very important this month and this is kind of kudos to Chris the governor small business forum will be in San Antonio on uh, December 13 2018 I know you've played a role in that and that's from 8 a.m. to 2 30 at the Marriott do you want to say anything else about it yeah if you have a register 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 and register we currently have a hundred registrants uh, they will take registration at the door it is twenty dollars as a low entry fee uh, we do have people who are going to be honored um, that I just really feel uh, very excited about. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Kerr, she's going to be honored. SJ and J Solutions is going to be one of the uh, uh, black-owned companies that the governor's office will will recognize. Uh, when the governor's office approached me about the governor's forum, uh, they said that they wanted to uh, honor African Americans in business. That was the first thing that they wanted to do. So, you haven't seen that at the state level ever. This is the first time. And as such, we have African American businesses uh, that are in position to be recognized at the state level. So, congratulations! Thank uh, you. Uh, Thank uh, told this morning that you're going to be honored and recognized. Uh, there are uh, four others, five others, uh, but again, uh, actually, uh, Joe Monroe's uh, Consolidated Installation Support, which uh, that uh, company was the first African American company that uh, received a contract uh, coming out of that uh, zero dollar bond situation as a client. So that was landmark, and so he'll be uh, honored and his, his family. And so um, there's three others. This escapes me, but register, be there to support them. And, um, and what's, the, just, what's the registration link? Uh, the registration link, uh, we can send it out again. Uh, the city has already sent it out once. Oh, okay. But, but thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, Michael can do that again for us. And um, did you cover all your events? Yes, sir. Okay, and then uh, the Global Chamber is having uh, a mixer uh, at uh, Medio Plaza at 4 o'clock. So if anyone wants to attend, you're more than welcome to come crash our party. Um, and the address is, the address is 1014 Peabody Avenue. And um, that's near Port San Antonio. And, Amy Contreras is our guest speaker from the City of San Antonio Economic Development Department. And she'll talk more about um, uh, what her role is and, and, and helping to help businesses in this international space that we talked about. So uh, and I'm, the, I'm the Executive Director of Global Change. Okay, so uh, any other announcements? A future business yes actually so I was going through some of the last minute meetings and there were a few things that got um, kind of pushed to the wayside so there were I wanted to make a, a point order for it so Chris you had actually asked about the allocation of funds to different chambers of commerce 
yes. with regards to equity on how much we're supporting Hispanic, African American, and such and so. I'm not sure if, if something can be just kind of updated as a report. It doesn't have to be in January, but I don't want it to fall by the wayside. I believe it's an initiative included in the Diversity Action Plan under reporting. Okay. Where we tucked it, I can't remember the time frame, but yes, it's a task that y'all put us in. I don't know which committee, but I, I remember diversity action plan. I apologize. Yeah, it was in the yeah I, I want to say it was in both, but okay. I want I want to make sure that that doesn't fall by the wayside. And then the second was brought up with the LGBT chamber and outreach with regards to certification, so extending them an invitation to be involved. Uh, was there and then Randy had asked about the airport and the DBE program. Yes, that's on. And so again, for future reference, just want to make sure this don't fall. Yep. Okay. All right. So our next meeting is scheduled for. We don't have anything that's scheduled for December. This was our December meeting. This was supposed to be our December meeting. Uh, we will schedule something for January that we'll send out. Um, I believe it's the 18th is what it's currently scheduled for. Um, and we'll send something out as a reminder. Okay. All right. I can entertain a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Randy. I will second. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.